Uh, just before we move on to the next discussion, ladies and gentlemen, if I could just remind you about social media. If you are taking any pictures today or you're taking any little videos, uh, we would really appreciate it if you could follow on all platforms of social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. It's the Education 2.0 Conference on all forms. And also, if you are on LinkedIn, you can use the hashtag Education2Conf. And of course, it's all about networking today as well, isn't it? Meeting new people, so you can, of course, do that on LinkedIn. Uh, but it's time now to move on to our next fireside chat this afternoon, which is going to touch on the significance of taking a closer look at the social cognition and motivation of young students with autism spectrum disorders, since this is going to help educators understand how they may provide better social and academic support for those with it. So I'd like to invite to the stage, first of all, the moderator for this discussion. Could you please put your hands together, everybody, for Diego Nunez Fernandez Shaw, I hope I pronounced that correctly, a head teacher and partner at Limitless Minds International College. So this discussion is thinking differently, social cognition and social motivation of students with autism spectrum disorders. So a round of applause, please, everyone. Hi. Good afternoon, um, happy to be here. Um, the first I, thing is I, I want to tell you that I'm happy and honored to lead this discussion. Uh, and I'm going to ask my colleagues to come to the stage with me. Uh, Mr. Andre Perren, who is basically a writer, a consultant, and an expert on autism. And who I basically think by actually meeting him beforehand has a really, really deep insights on students with learning difficulties and can give you a really, really good explanation on different ways of approaching these kind of issues. I also would like to come to the stage uh, Mr. Anish Behedi, which is an entrepreneur, a key keynote conferencer, and innovative young man that has um, basically a system that has developed with cards and decks in order to work with this kind of students. And finally, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit of how we organized this uh, fireside chat. Our idea basically is to give a, a little introduction, each of us, and then we're going to begin talking about different topics that uh, are regarding autism and how to deal with these students with special needs. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the panel, we're going to leave a little bit of time so people can ask us questions about how we organize these things. So thank you very much. Okay, so I was, as I was saying, I come from Spain. I come from Madrid. Uh, I'm the head teacher of an international school that is British. Uh, it's basically in the north of Madrid. Uh, it's a really, really special school. And um, in order for you to understand what we do, I'm going to try to make it simple and compare it with a movie, okay? It's really similar to the X-Men movie, okay, in the sense that uh, we have a really different collection of students, okay? Uh, first of all, we are a school that only offers students uh, between age 12 to 18, so we're specialized on teenagers. We do not have any primary students. And we basically uh, work in little groups, up to five students per class, and one-to-one -one classes. The reason for having such an amount of individualization is that we work with really, really specific profiles, one of those are going to be the ones that we're going to talk today. But basically, the five profiles we work with mostly are um, professional athletes, which we have a couple of students. Uh, we also work with students that have been in hospitals, and they need to have specialized classes until they can go back to their traditional classrooms. We also work as well with uh, students with learning difficulties that go from TDH, TDA, um, autism that goes from lower levels to highest levels as well. Um, we also work with students that are gifted and talented, and we also work with students that have suffered really, really complex cases of bullying. So, uh, as you can imagine, those are quite different uh, profiles of students. So, we do we wanted from the initial um, origin of the school not to work for the standard student, for the average student, but to actually design a school that would be different and uh, would cater 
they uh, would say the extremes or the different uh, poles of the student curve that would not be covered by other schools. So we basically work with really complex students. And apart from that, the only other thing that I would say it's really important before I move on to my colleagues is that uh, each student in our school has a different calendar, a different schedule. So we have like a really advanced computer algorithm that controls the whole school. And basically each student has its own unique program and has its own unique uh, set of subjects and they basically follow it through. So you can imagine the amount of bureaucracy and complexity in it, even in a small school in order to cater to so many different cases. Okay, so now I'll, I'll let you and Mr. Andre. Hello, so. thank you all, welcome. Um, I'm glad to be here to talk about autism, to create awareness around autism. It's my personal purpose. Uh, I went to many places in the world to talk about the subject. Uh, in my career, 25 years now, I work with, with youngsters with autism. For now, company, we support all kind of organization, try to understand the autism and guide the autism. And we do that a lot in schools. I'm not a teacher. Maybe I'm the only one not teacher. Really. <laughs> um, but that's no problem because uh, I think it's important to help the students with autism, but also the teachers and the teams. So when I look around and uh, if we know that maybe almost 2% of the population of a country is diagnosed with autism, I think we all have maybe one or two students in our classroom who has autism in normal education. So can you put your hands up if you work with students with autism? Yeah, you see, I see a lot of them. Of course, in special needs school, schools, the, the youngsters with autism will be more. But I'm glad to talk about the subject and uh, looking okay. forward to it, Diego. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mr. Anish, can you give us a little bit of introduction? So, um, I was just, uh, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, you know, making me sit in this panel and talk about this, uh, this topic. So, I was reading this, uh, an autistic person wrote this and he said that we are fresh water fish in salt water. Put us in fresh water and we function just fine. Put us in salt water and we struggle to survive. So I think that gives us the context of, um, you know, how they feel. Um, I personally think that it's a, uh, instead of treating it as a disorder, if we treat it as a differentiation or maybe a neurodiversity, like just treating them as a different sort of a personality who have a different learning mechanism. If we do that, chances are um, we won't be treating it as a disorder, we would be treating it as a different way of making them learn. I will give you my own personal uh, life example. So when I was starting off my career, uh, some 22 years back when I was starting off my career, I changed about six jobs in a span of nine months. And at that point of time, I was feeling, you know, a bit weird, you know, what's happening with me, why I'm not able to stick into one specific job. But um, today I feel that when I sit and connect the dots, I feel extremely proud about it because I was able to make faster, quicker, uh, strong decision. I was testing waters. So in a way, I was also very different. And I feel completely comfortable in my skin today uh, because I think that has shaped my journey. So I, my opening, uh, this would be, instead of treating it as a disorder, just treat it as a differentiation, so yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anish. Uh, let's get to the matter in hand. Um, I would like to start the discussion talking about what I believe uh, in my school as an example, I'm gonna give you like real data. Uh, the amount of students with special needs can get up to a 60% of the total population of students. So we're talking about huge amounts of access arrangements, huge amounts of um, 
any kind of learning difficulties and a, and a huge amount of psychological support for our students. Uh, as Mr. Nish has basically stated, uh, these are basically differences. It's differentiation, okay? And we have talked about in this conference about individualization, okay? About giving each student what they deserve, okay? And I think the best way to open this discussion is the difference, and this is uh, this I basically saw multiple times being referred, between equity and equality, okay? In my humble opinion, lots of educators in the world confuse the concept of giving students equal treatment to giving students equity, which is basically giving every student what they deserve. So let's picture a classroom. If we have a teacher that explains exactly the same to all students in class, is that teacher being fair? Yes, it's being fair. Is the teacher providing equity to the classroom? Is it allowing to be inclusive? It is allowing to, for students to special needs to adapt to that kind of lecture? No. So people tend to confuse equality in education and especially sometimes equality of opportunities and equality of outcome with equity, okay? What we are going to talk about in this lecture is how can we provide or promote, in this case, equity, which is giving every student what they deserve. And from a personal point of view, I do not believe in making things easier for students, especially those with learning difficulties, because that usually backfires at the end. Equity is not about having students with special needs that have lower level requirements of lower level of expectations of grades, and then we'll go to success stories that we can talk about. But it's about having the same expectations for all students equally, uh, allowing them to develop as much as possible, and helping them reach their outcomes in a different way. And that's what really equity means about. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one, Diego. Uh, I always ask the school, uh, do you dare to make a difference for a child or for a student? And uh, it's not about equality, because around autism, there's a lot of stigmatization. We know, all know the movie Rain Man. And we, uh, we talk about autism, we always think about that movie, but autism is much more. Uh, so what I always tell the school, make a difference. Eh? We talk a lot, like this conference, we do a lot of with speech. For students with autism, that can be difficult. So I always give the advice, do some visualization, always on the background, not only tell what to do, or read down what to do. There's a little adjustments. You can help a lot in a classroom. So it isn't so much work at all to, to uh, make that happen in the classroom. And, and that's uh, the way we have to work with the students. Yeah, I totally agree with your point of view. Mr. Anish, how do you think, for example, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you have quite innovative methods around deck cards and around uh, ways of actually approaching these students and making them motivated emotionally? Yeah, so I want to cite one example. Uh, so basically, I'm a chartered accountant. So, um, you know, being a CA, after completing my CA, I went to Australia. I lived there for about 10, 11 years. And I went there to do my MBA program. And while I was doing my MBA program, um, uh, I had a chance of interacting with one of the student who was having some sort of learning uh, challenges. And, um, you know, he was struggling to understand accounting, which was a core subject in MBA program. Um, the classroom pace was very fast. Uh, he was unable to grasp the concept. And I was somehow feeling the pain. Uh, I don't know why, but I was feeling that pain. And I, uh, I got this idea. I don't know how I got this idea, but um, I got this idea of creating a deck of cards. Um, and because the idea of deck of cards is, it is a, when we, when we think about deck of cards, it's all about being playful, being fun, you know, experiential. So I felt like, is it possible to make accounting fun? Um, and maybe for him, you know, is it possible to make accounting fun? And I kid you not, um, I created the deck of cards and in 90 minutes flat, anyone from non-accounting background, anyone from non-accounting background can understand accounting just by playing with cards. So, and I experienced that with 
you know, him and he understood accounting because there was no stress. It was like just playing cards, understanding. And it was very, as you know, uh, Diego just mentioned that it, is, it was slightly made more personalized initially. And then, you know, I felt, okay, this is the kind of challenge which everyone is facing. So can I create a format around it? So that was a real life inspiration for me to create the deck of cards on accounting. And um, yeah, and later on I've created another deck of cards so I can mention that later on. So yeah, thank you. Okay. So um, basically we are all agreeing that the way we should treat these students is different. And basically I think one of the best advices I could give, this is my personal advice, on having a school with uh, such a high amount of special needs, because I have seen in today's conference, there's multiple head teachers, there's examination uh, officers and people from different levels of education, is a, a certain amount of key ideas, okay? Which I'm actually practicing right now in my school, and they are working really well. And it took me a lot of time to identify them. So the first advice I would give you, specific advice, to actually solve these kind of issues or at least help integrate these uh, students with learning difficulties. They ca it can be autism or it can be any other learning difficulty. My first advice would be uh, to have a high ratio of psychologists. And this is not maybe the answer that you were expecting, or maybe yes, but at least from where I come from in Spain, you usually have a psychologist in school, which is not usually compulsory. Um, and you usually have a school of 1,000, 1,500 students with only one psychologist. Now you can imagine what happens. I think you can see the psychologist once per year if you're lucky. So if you have a learning difficulty, you need to wait in line. And that's why most even private schools or public schools in Spain do not adapt or, uh, or do any adaptations to students that have learning difficulties, which, because these students have in reality, they are disfavored in three ways. The, the main way, or the first way, is because they are not diagnosed. The second way is because the, when they are diagnosed, nobody is going to do anything about that. And the third way is when they try to reach their own objectives, as they have this disadvantage or this difficulty, um, they are in a lower position of um, success rate. So at the end of the day, uh, they need to be supported. So my first thought, what I have basically developed, is a strong team of psychologists in my school, which is on a ratio of 1 to 50, 1 to 40. You cannot imagine how many difficulties, fights, um, issues between teachers, issues between students, have been solved by having a strong team of psychologists that are working full-time and uh, giving their advice whenever there's meetings of the uh, management team or the board. It, it basically helps a lot. So I do recommend as a first piece of advice uh, to bring psychologists in and to let them have full opinion over educational matters. And as an example, in my reports every three months or every month, uh, apart from having a science grade or a um, math grade or a language grade, there's also a comment box for the psychologist to talk about how are the students emotionally progressing. And I have been astonished to see that parents sometimes do not even look at the grades, which means they come to my meetings and they do not even know what the grades from their kids are, but they do, not, but they do know how they are basically doing emotionally. So that would be my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is having individualized educational programs for each student that has learning difficulties. That means that if you have a student with autism, having him in the class expecting things to be solved on their own is not going to work. So you need to have a plan for the short, midterm, and long term. And my advice as well is uh, to allow psychologists or to allow people that have training on special needs to conduct a first interview on the student when it, it accesses school. Why? Because most parents are not clear about uh, the information res uh, in respect to the students or they are not well enough trained in order to give you that information. So having a second uh, opinion is always useful. And the last thing that I would uh, basically tell you to incorporate or as a piece of advice 
is to work really closely with psychologists and psychiatrists and people, like for example, in this case, Andre, which basically is doing consultancy and helping with uh, Mr. Nish as well, um, helping from the outside to schools, because there's no communication. And one of the things that have done or were successful in my school from the start is we created a really close relationship with the most important psychiat psychiatrists and psychological groups from Madrid. So there's a constant feedback going in and out between the school and the progress the students are doing in special needs. And that has changed a lot. So um, in this case, for example, Andre, I would like to know, uh, as you were a consultant, uh, what are your three top things you think um, whenever you give advice to schools, they do not do well and therefore it doesn't work at the end? Uh, for the first, yeah, what I notice, we do training like, okay, uh, let's uh, send someone to a training about autism. But I, I studied autism for a very long time. I worked over 25 years with youngsters with autism. It's really difficult to think like that autistic thinking. So. What I really miss is schools go uh, with it. They do a training, but there's no follow-up. No uh, coaching on a job uh, with, with colleagues, talk about it and, and uh, talk about situations and learn from each other. So the main thing is to really understand the autism and create awareness. You have to be have a long-term view, not just short things like, okay, uh, we have a speaker, he comes about talk about autism, he goes home and we know how to work with autism. Now that's not the way, it's a long way. And you have some, I think the main problem like in the Netherlands at this moment is to find good teachers who have passion to work with these uh, children because you have some extra passion. You need some extra um, things like uh, patience, be clear. So I don't know how it's in your country or by other people, but I think the main problem this moment is to find good people who want to work with these students. Uh, I think we have to invest in that because if I look in the Netherlands, I did, I did some research. We have, I think, 8,000 children have no education today, young children. And the main group is children with autism. They did a uh, research for adults with autism and it really uh, struck me, like 75% of adults with autism have no job. So we have a job to do. Uh, uh, we need inclusion. And I think it starts with education. So it's, uh, it's really great to hear that your school is very good with autism awareness. Yeah, to, just to follow up on what Andre was saying, um, after COVID-19, um, uh, we basically had to go online for three, four, six months in Spain. And Spain was hit really hard, at least initially. So we had like six months of no school. And when we went back, and this is, this is actually what I was uh, commenting with uh, Andre before actually this conference, um, I was basically having like three, four interviews in order to, to go into the different programs we have in the school per day. I would say that 60, 70% of those students that have completely missed school, they were completely unhappy, they were totally depressed, they were in a really, really dark spot. Almost all of them had autism. And it was like that for two, three weeks, nonstop. And as Andre was saying, when there are pandemics, when there is uh, stress, especially on the um, educational system, uh, the people that pay it the most are the people with special needs. That's why I think this, this topic or this um, fireside chat is so relevant because people do not notice that in general, when these things happen, uh, almost always the same people are paying the price and there's a huge amount of um, requirement or a necessity for uh, people to develop and specialized into special education because the numbers are growing. We do not have a lot of teachers. Uh, obviously, not a lot of them are qualified. And those that are qualified require a huge amount of uh, development and special needs. So I would like also to ask uh, Mr. Anish, um, in your opinion, 
if you had a student that has special needs, like let's say autism, how would you approach classes with them? How, how would you basically try to deal with this equity issue? A uh, very good question. I actually uh, want to steal from what you just mentioned before that you know uh, there is a need for having a psychologist, um, and that need that ratio which you mentioned, like one you know fifty student should have at least one psychologist. Um, I will slightly uh, have a slightly different opinion here. I would say that instead of looking for a psychologist, why don't we make them self-psychologist for themselves. So in a way, what I'm trying to say is like uh, building, you know, self-motivation, you know, helping them, you know, understand themselves slightly better uh, and trying to, uh, of course, it's a, it's a, you know, autism spectrum disorder. So people who are at the high end of the spectrum would need help and assistance, but people who are you know, in the mid range or maybe slightly in the lower range can at least start, you know, healing themselves or loving themselves or self-motivation, whatever you want to call that. So that will also give them some sort of, a, you know, confidence that they can, you know, handle. And I would say that uh, one more thing which I personally feel, um, the, the concept of, the Japanese concept of ikigai, um, it is basically finding your own purpose in life. If you can inspire them to find their own purpose in life, or if you can help them understand, it's a very simple concept. I've actually simplified it in another deck of cards, which is called as Life Deck. And it's a deck of 52 cards created to teach negative emotions, positive emotions. So it's not about don't be angry. It's not about don't feel irritated. Don't feel the pain. It's not about that. You have to go through pain. You have to go through anger. And it's, it's a journey. So I've created those negative emotion cards and then slowly and gradually it goes into the positive emotion, uh, you know, getting into mindfulness, getting into meditation. And then the last card is on purpose, which is Ikigai. And I break it down in simple three steps. One is you need to find what are your core skills. In fact, you can do it if you feel so, you can do it later on also. You just need to find five core skills which you are really good at, which you feel that you are really talented. So for some, it would be like a musician, painting, speaking, public speaking, you know, communication. It could be anything. Uh, and then you need to find out three areas where you are getting paid today or where you will get paid in the future. So it could be a future skill where you can get paid. So maybe you are getting paid for you know, doing a public speaking engagement. So what are those three things where you are getting paid for? And then the last section is the most important section and that is the love part. What is that you love to do at three o'clock in the morning without getting paid? So even if you find two things, two areas which you really love to do, all you need to do now is to find a common thread between the three sections. Something which you are really skilled at, something which you are getting paid for currently or in future, and something which you really love to do. Now, if you can, sim if you can explain this simple concept to students with special needs, um, you are actually inspiring them to find their own purpose. And when you find your purpose, the purpose is going to pull you rather than you pushing yourself. So it will create a pull effect. So I would say um, two areas. One, to become your own healer. Try to become your own healer. And as I said, like if you're in the higher um, level of the spectrum, obviously take support. But if you are in the mid range or lower, then try and do it on your, like try and heal yourself. And second is see if you can find or if you can inspire them to find their purpose in life. So yeah, those are my two points. Yeah, I agree totally with Mr. Nish. At the end of the day, um, I think motivation, and we have already talked about this in the conference extensively, is a key factor for students nowadays for multiple reasons that we have discussed previously. It is even more important regarding students with special needs. Um, I would add that, um, as, as Mr. Nish is saying, uh, every student has a unique gift 
and I believe in the concept of uh, finding that gift and empowering them to develop it. At the end of the day, um, students need to feel they are good at something. And sometimes motivation comes from feeling that there's something or some subject or some area on the school that you can actually do great in. And it's basically the role of the educator and, um, and the managers as well, or the principals, to basically uh, give an academic curriculum that allows students to have all those options, yes? Um, one of the options that I can tell you as an example is, um, in our school, one of the commitments that we had was to offer as many subjects as possible. So we do something really weird, which is we offer like, um, for sixth form, which is the last two years of school, we offer like 50 different subjects. And there's like uh, around like 45,000 combinations of different curriculums that the student can take in order to graduate and go university. Um, in students with um, special needs, what we have noticed, and I'm going to give you an example, is that um, there's a lot of students that are not doing the right subjects because the students are not interviewed correctly initially, they are not listened to, and this we already discussed previously, and so people do not take enough time to really listen to what the students want to do. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, if you do not know what to do in Spain, you become a lawyer, okay? So in Spain, that's how it is. So you don't know what to do, you become a lawyer. And um, well, this may make sense for some students, but for any other students, well, it's not best, basically the best thing. And um, I would like to finish, and then we'll go to questions because we're running out of time, with an example from a real case scenario, which I think it's always like helpful. Um, we had a student, okay, joining our school when he was uh, 15, 14. Um, he came from another uh, international school. Uh, he was a student with autism. He was getting really, really, really anxious and really aggressive and violent towards other students and towards staff of the other school, up to a point where the other international school thought that that, would not, that was not basically manageable and they basically uh, expelled the student, okay? The student then went into another school and another school until it reached mine. Uh, the student was in a really big depression and emotionally damaged to a point of uh, not even wanting to basically wake up in the morning. So I'm talking about really deep um, thoughts and things like this. And um, if you see him right now and you see him supported, and you see him like, uh, what we noticed, and this maybe both of you can discuss before we finish, what uh, we noticed is that um, when we place the student doing arts, he changes completely. And this was a student that was forced to take sciences or to take the subjects that were available in school because the head teacher or the other members of the staff thought that he was not capable of doing anything else. So they forced and forced and forced and forced up to a point where the student broke. And if you see him right now, almost finishing school, going to probably a really good university, probably in Milan or in some place in Italy regarding design and arts. And it was all about finding what he was good at. And by trial and error and by giving him chance to express himself and to see what he really likes we basically found out that he was really good at um, building Legos and doing creative uh, stuff. So we thought, hey, how about we try to give you a degree or a future in creativity or design or something like this that would basically better suit your, your profile. So what do you think about this? Uh, a great story, <laughs> Diego. Yeah. Uh, I, we can talk a lot of the, the success stories, uh, but the main subject for today is about uh, social connection, and let me uh, tell something about that because I see we have seven minutes, and then when I think like autistic thinking, they're okay, it's seven minutes, and then we'll finish. Um, social, sometimes people say, yeah, they don't want to be social. That's the biggest mistake we make. People with autism also want to interact with you social, with us, go with groups, have friends, uh, but the only problem is they don't always understand the rules. They call it active but odd. It's the same that you want to play a game of soccer. 
but you don't understand the rules. So uh, you, you uh, come along, but you, it's a little bit strange. Eh? So you get laughed off or get bullied from, along, uh, from the child on. So things go wrong. Our job, our job is to guide them because uh, they interfere the world differently than we do. They process things differently than we do. So we guide them on how, how do we uh, social interact and how do we do it in the right way. I think uh, the success story with your uh, student is also, it's a lot of anxiety, yeah? social anxiety to go to school, get bullied. Uh, I don't understand. I once worked with a boy who said, please, I thought when I was young, and the aliens would pick me up because I live in the, in, the, in the wrong world. I don't understand anything what anybody's doing. So that was his, his problem. He thought, I, I'm living in a, in, a, in a strange world. So that's autism. And then we often see it back in difficult behavior, uh, challenging behavior, but all they do is ask for help. So uh, I hope you all uh, agree with that and make, make work of it. Yeah. At your school. Anything extra? So sure. I would just um, like to add that if they don't understand the way we teach, we teach them the way they understand. Uh, and just to dissolve confusion around things like depression, you know, what is depression? I mean, I'll just take one minute and explain depression. Depression is when your, ex your expectation is very high. You will always feel depressed when your expectation is high from yourself or from people around you, if they have expectation upon you. And if you change that expectation to appreciation, like what you, what you can appreciate right now, you can come out of depression like that. So sometimes we, we do depression on ourselves. We don't go through depression. So just teaching all this concept from a slightly different perspective, slightly different lens will, you know, inspire them. So thank you very much. We have got four minutes. Okay, so we have four minutes left. A couple of questions. Anyone wants to do a question? Thank you. I don't think we have enough time to even slightly dig into this topic. There's so much I want to ask. But one of the things that is abundantly clear is that as leaders of schools, we need to change how we run schools. Rather than, I believe, tailoring to the outliers, we need to create a framework for learning that everyone feels safe and secure. And that means understanding neurodivergent humans. So, Andre, my question is for you. As a head of a school, what are th some key principles we need to recognise when establishing a framework that that pr promotes safety? First of all, uh, they often say to me, Andre, you're a specialist. No, I'm not a specialist. Your student with autism is a specialist of his own, own autism. So it's very important to make him a part of the plan. Uh, I don't know which age your students are. Are they living at home still? I'm a head of a K to 13 school. So for me, it's about creating a framework in a school yeah, where yeah. children it, of all needs need to yeah. thrive. Because for autism, it's, it's, it's a, for children with autism, it's sometimes very difficult. There's so much aspects uh, they did research, they have more anxiety, anxiety for, uh, for them with them themselves. So I think it's a good part to a school to uh, watch over them, hear them, see them, and what they need. Don't make them always special. Huh? As a child, you don't want to be always special, but you can make some, for example, with one student I worked, uh, when he gets stressed, you must go out of the classroom because otherwise he would get really angry. But he don't want to work with like the timeout cards. You know them? When this, I'm stressed, I go out. Okay, we don't do that. We made an agreement. He would um, lay his pen on the right of the table. Nobody saw it, only the teacher. So, okay, you're stressed, you may go. That's uh, the main thing. We have to make it very individual but no one uh, else has, has to see it. So yeah. we may be from a bad English, but <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I hope I, I made my point. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, we can discuss this later, but regarding framework, which is one of the most difficult things for school, and I understand what your, your point is. Um, 
based on the same idea, idea that Andre was saying, what we did in our school is we basically have a safeguarding adult that is its trusted adult for each kid. And that trusted adult doesn't require to be the tutor, doesn't require to be the psychologist, doesn't require to be the PE teacher. It can be any adult that is selected by the student on its own, as long as it is written in paper. So what happens is, whenever there's an issue regarding bullying, regarding any kind of things like this in our school, what usually happens is that the students go and talk to their safeguarding adult which is usually the, the person of most confidence. Usually it's the language teacher, the PE teacher, doesn't matter. And those ones report on a structure to usually the people in charge. And what happens is we try to solve that before it gets really, really complex. Um, in order to have special needs students uh, safe, I agree with uh, Mr. Andre in the sense that you cannot have a different protocol for special needs and traditional students, because what happens is they get basically signaled, and they are they are aware that they have that difference. So it needs to be for everyone the same, and uh, there's different layers that you can add, like uh, safeguarding adults. Uh, you can, uh, for example, what worked for us really well as well, and this I'll talk in another day is um, having students uh, get into safety groups. So the first week of school we do not give classes, no classes at all. So we lose one whole, whole week of academic classes. And the only point of that week is to have every vulnerable student to have a friend. So that's what we do. And once they have that friend, at least one, and we, they know they are safe and they are not eating alone or things like this, the chances for safeguarding concerns do not disappear but they slow down. Uh, another example, uh, in a big, big school in the Netherlands, a normal school, we, we made a special classroom. Rebound, we call it, for children who have sometimes need the urge to go away from the busy classroom. And there can all be kind of problems, children with anxiety, children with problematic behavior, but also children with autism. And we can, like in the middle of the day, when the stress is high, they go to the special classroom where one guide one teacher is there, only one, so it's very uh, convenient. Small class, no senses, they can, li like a battery, they charge, and they go back to class for the second day, part of the day. That works very fine. Yeah, that's a sensory room. Yeah, like something like that. Thank okay. you. So we're out of time, so in order not to push it further. We can talk hours about the subject. Yeah, maybe. yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, thanks a lot. Thank you.